Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. It's Wednesday night, and that means that we are right here with you for Friends in Fiction. We have an amazing evening ahead of us, and you might notice that we have a special guest tonight. Um, Kristen had a little bit of a flight issue, and she's actually on a plane right now coming home, so she cannot be with us. So our Meg, who we all love and adore, has stepped in to be our fabulous host tonight, and we're so excited to have her. Um, I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Mary Kay. I'm Mary Kay. This is Friends in Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we will be talking with bestselling authors Ellen Hildebrand and Jamie Brenner, and Robin Carr will be joining us for the after show. You know how much we love a big announcement. And today, we have a great one for you. We are so grateful for your amazing response to our new Behind the Book partnership with our friends at Fable. You know what it is. We've been talking about it. It's the free app for your phone or your tablet with loads of incredible book clubs to join. And if you haven't joined our premium club full of behind the scenes information, that you won't get anywhere else. It's just $5 a month to join our club, or you can get the big annual premium all access membership for $70 for the entire year to join all the premium clubs on Fable, including LeVar Burton's book club. So I don't know about you, but I'd sure love to visit my reading rainbow days. But <laughs> this month, so we have done Christie's book on Fable. We have done the um, Mary Kay's new book on Fable, The Home Wreckers. And this month, with a drum roll, please. Who's going to do my drum roll? I, I'm doing one, but I feel like that's really your job. I mean, you're kind of like the best oh. at drum rolls. Sound effects. That's a good one. This month, we will be reading Ellen Hildebrand's The Hotel Nantucket. Yay! So Christy will be leading not only our discussion tonight, but also the discussion all month long on Fable. She will be having comments that you can interact. We'll be taking a deep dive behind the scenes of the Hotel Nantucket. So that is our big announcement for the night. Yay! We're so excited. And um, it has been it was so great to get to, we've already kind of started getting prepared and it's really weird to do an interview about someone else's book, like, and to talk that in depth about someone else's book. And it was really fun. So I really enjoyed it and can't wait for you guys to get to read along with us. So speaking of fun subscriptions, we have teamed up with our friends at Booktown where we got to see so many of you guys live earlier this year to offer the Friends in Fiction first edition book subscription for 2023. So the purchase of the special first edition Friends in Fiction box includes each of our new and signed hardcover releases for 2023, which includes My The Summer of Songbirds, Patty's The Secret Book of Flora Leah in May, Kristen's The Paris Daughter in June, and Mary Kay's um, super secret special holiday book in September name TBD. And you will also receive a fun gift with the first box. So this is four different boxes and the $125 subscription price includes shipping and tax, which is about 20% off the cover price. So yay, more information is available on Booktown's website and on our Friends in Fiction Facebook page. And I'm so happy to tell you that we've got one more live in-person event this season. We want to see you there. We're having a great signing and meet and greet with Bethany Beach Books in Delaware on July 20th at 6 p.m. and a luncheon event the next day on July 21st 
with Browse About Books in Rehoboth Beach. We hope you can join us on the road for this big Friends and Fiction Live celebration. We are so excited for the opportunity to see so many of you in person. You can find the links and get your tickets under pin post on our Facebook page or on the Browse About Books and Bethany Beach Books websites. And if you think you're going to come, start planning because you got to find a place to stay, right? Yeah. It's summer. It's the beach. Yeah. Hard to get a place there. And don't forget, as you know, we continue to encourage you to support independent booksellers when and where you can. And one way to do that is to visit our own Friends in Fiction bookshop.org page, where you can find Ellen's books, Jamie's books, and Robin Carr's books, and books by the four Friends in Fiction hosts and our past guests, all at a discount. Bookshop has raised more than $21 million for independent bookstores and is a great one-click online alternative for shopping small and shopping local. Now, if you've been with us the past few weeks, you know that each week we are giving you a chance to ask us anything. So if you have a question that you would like us to answer or a topic you'd like to discuss, we are all ears. So feel free to drop questions in the comments here or anywhere on our Facebook page because we want to hear from you and what you want to talk about. So we got so many good questions this week, um, but this one, oh my gosh, this one blew me away. So this is from our dear friend, Bubba Wilson, and it is a must ask. Imagine you are Maui from the movie Moana, and instead of a fish hook, you have a magic bookmark that enables you to shape shift. And your shape shift is not in any way to benefit mankind, but it is purely selfish. So you can feel what it's like to be a ladybug or a dolphin or a giraffe or like literally anything you want. So, and this is really cute. This is from Bubba. She said, Maui is half God, half mortal, all awesome. That's the reason this question is relevant to you fabulous four who are half book gods, half mortals, with families you love, and all awesome. <laughs> oh, that's adorable. Uh, I mean, but what a great question. Oh my gosh. So when I first when I first read that, I, I thought of like 10 different things I wanted to shape shift mm -hmm. into. And I've only seen the movie Moana at least 15 times, 20 times <laughs> with my granddaughter. Um, but in the end, I decided that it would be a dolphin. And if anybody watches me on Instagram, I'm always down at the river looking for dolphin and, and I'm fascinated by them and they seem like such magical creatures. So I think that is what I would be. How about you, Meg? Well, can you believe I've never seen Moana, but I think it's- I haven't either. <laughs> My kids are more. I need to watch it. It's Wait. so good. It's so Which good. Is more the jackass age than the mo than the Disney. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm totally coming back or whatever as a dog, and not only a dog, one of my dogs, because <laughs> they have it really great, and I would love to feel what it's like to get that much attention and affection, <laughs> that joyful all the time, bounce around and just get loved up on and. Get yeah, your walkies and your hugs and your belly rubs and um, yeah, I'm coming back as as either um, Spike or Izzy or Sadie. Your dogs yeah. are so stinking cute too. <laughs> oh, thanks. They are. I think I'm coming back as a hummingbird. Ooh. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I can just flit from gorgeous flower to flower and sip nectar and scream at other birds who other hummingbirds who get in my territory. You know, hummingbirds are very territorial. I know this from watching the hummingbirds at my feet. And, you know, they don't have to write books. All they have to do is <laughs> they don't have to write books. Suck nectar all day and fly. It seems like a great life to me. <laughs> they don't have to write books. Although you never know. This could be like when we used to sit around and think, wouldn't it be great to be an author? All you have to do is just like sit at your computer and write books. Like maybe the hummingbird has all these secret responsibilities that like you're not aware of. Yeah. Do you think <laughs> no, I think I would want to feel what it was like to be a bird too. Like I think flying is like pretty cool. So, but like a bird that migrates to warm places because y'all you know I don't really like to be cold. So that would be yeah, like hummingbirds. They they they, they, they migrate. Yeah. See, I'm yeah. learning so much. This is why you come to Friends in Fiction. It's just yeah, a it learning experience. It's <laughs> not just books. It's nature and 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 facts. We should have a daily, we should start having an every Wednesday night new fact. Yeah. yeah. That's a great idea. Who's going <laughs> to find that? 
<laughs> we could ask little Will. You know how like when like ten year olds like they always have like some facts yes. that they know. We can ask him. He'll he'll know. He can do our daily facts. The Will <laughs> fact for the night. Yeah, exactly. Now, not that this has not been the most riveting section of the show, but it's time to welcome our guests, Ellen Hildebrand and Jamie Brenner. Ellen Hildebrand is the best-selling author of 28 novels. You heard me right, 28, including Summer of 69, Golden Girl, 28 Summers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. After a short time working in publishing and teaching in New York City, Ellen moved to Nantucket permanently in 1994 and published her first novel, The Beach Club, in the summer of 2000. Her novel, Summer 69, debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Ellen is a 1991 graduate of Johns Hopkins University, where she majored in writing seminars. And in her senior year at Hopkins, her first short story, Misdirection, was accepted for publication in Seventeen magazine. She also attended the University of Iowa Writers Workshop and earned her MFA. She loves cooking, riding the Peloton, and going to the beach. And she's a mom of three children. She plans to retire with her, yeah. summer, <laughs> with her summer 2024 book and aims to become a book influencer. The Hotel Nantucket was just released on June 14th. And hit number one on the Nantucket. Number one. That's right. Thank Jamie you. Brenner is the best-selling author of several novels, including The Forever Summer, The Wedding Sisters, and Blush. The Forever Summer is a national bestseller, and Booklist hailed her novel Blush as a delectable soap that is a, the epitome of escapist reading pleasure. In 2016, when Jamie published her novel, The Wedding Sisters, our other guest this evening, Ellen, gave Jamie a blurb, and Jamie credits this as a life-changing moment for her, noting how it made her feel like a real author. I love that. I love that. Jamie grew up in suburban Philadelphia, and she then went on to study literature at the George Washington University before moving to New York City, where she worked for HarperCollins, then BarnesandNoble.com, and Vogue.com before becoming an author. Jamie currently divides her time between New York City and Philadelphia, but right now, She's here with me in Beaufort, North Carolina. Yay! Surprise! Surprise. Come on. Come on down. <laughs> Erica, can you bring Ellen on? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. You come true. Thank you, ladies. So excited you're here. This is so awesome. Oh, I got so excited that I forgot that I'm like in charge of running the show. <laughs> So welcome, Ellen and Jamie. We're so excited to have you. These books, oh my goodness, the ultimate escapes that should be on everyone's reading lists. But before we dive into all of the questions we want to ask you, um, can you tell anyone who somehow hasn't heard about these books yet what your book is about? And then our favorite, what your book is really about. So Ellen, do you want to start us off? Sure. So The Hotel Nantucket is basically what it might seem like. So it is a novel about a crumbling grand hotel that has been left, fallen into disrepair, is scooped up by a London billionaire named Xavier Darling. And he has two women to impress. And he only says who the first woman is. And that is Shelly Carpenter, who's an Instagram hotel influencer. She reviews hotels. She gives them one to five keys. She's never given a five key review. Xavier is determined to get it. He hires general manager, Elizabeth Keaton. She has just gone through a horrible, awful breakup and she's looking for a second act. And so she takes the helm at the hotel, she hires the staff and then she deals with the guests throughout the summer. And so the novel is essentially about the summer unfolding. Um, what the novel really is about is, I think ultimately it is a love letter to Nantucket and um, to the way of life there and to all of the businesses and the people and the characters that make it unique. Oh, I this is not a real question in the script and like no spoilers here. I just have to know, and I think readers are going to want to know too, if whether they have or have not, did you go into this knowing who Shelly was? Like, did you know her identity? I had okay. no idea who it was. And that I, is, it revealed itself about two thirds of the way through the book. I um, went, I, oh. I felt like that was probably the case. Cause I was really shocked. Yeah. Was shocked. Awesome. Yes. I was shocked. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So Jamie, yes, Christine. Can you please tell us about 
guilt. Look, Jamie and I are color. We didn't even plan this, but we are color coded to <laughs> the book. The, we match. Yeah. Here we are. Um, so can you tell us about guilt and then tell us what it's really about? Sure. This is so awkward because we're super close. We're so <laughs> close to each other. It's um, great. So yeah. guilt is oh, what it's about. I first of all, I've learned this from watching Friends and Fiction live on the road, and you guys, it is the best experience. So anyone out here who has not seen them together live. I felt like it was like I was reborn as a book lover, watch them together. Oh, I love how they do this. You. Here's what the book's about. Okay. What Guilt is about is a family, the Pavlin family, who created a, a jewelry empire, made their fortune selling diamond engagement rings. But all the sisters in the family are very unlucky in love. And when the book begins, this cast out granddaughter returns to the fold wanting to reclaim her birthright, this extraordinary pink diamond. Uh, and as an aspiring jeweler in her own right, she actually wants to reclaim the whole business for herself. And it's a quest that leads her from New York City to Provincetown, Cape Cod. What it's really about is what happens when we lose sight of what's really important in life. And when we get what is really love versus the things we use as symbols of love and how we fall into the trap of using those symbols thinking they are more important than the way we actually show love within a family mm. yeah that's that is it's so oh. good <laughs> i love it and i love how sometimes we don't even really know what it's really about until we're halfway three-fourths of the way through the novel and we're like oh <laughs> not just about that so i love hearing that jamie okay ellen you mentioned the last time we had you on the show that the Hotel Nantucket was classic Ellen Hildebrand. Yes. And boy, is it ever your gorgeous town is the setting, Blonde Sharon and the Nantucket crowd chiming in to give their opinions. And I have to tell you that the first book I read of yours and fell in love with your writing was The Blue Bistro. Okay. I yeah. love that book. And The Blue Bistro is even back in this novel. So it for is. readers who haven't had the pleasure of reading Hotel Nantucket yet, can you tell us a little bit about the Easter eggs you have hidden in this book? And more importantly, there seems to be some open windows or doors or at the end. So tell us a little bit. So at this point in my career, I've written a lot of books and a lot of them have memorable characters. And one of the fun things about, and all of my summer novels are standalones. And it's very important for me to say that they do have recurring characters, but I never wanted my summer books to be like, Oh, you have to read this first. Yeah. Um, my winter books of course are all series and they need to be read in order. And I'm adamant about that, but my summer books are standalones. Yeah. However, it has been so fun to bring in characters again and again and again. And of course it didn't, it didn't happen until like the last six or seven years because I didn't have the maturity as a writer. I didn't have the input from the readers to be like, yes, we really love seeing the chief reappear. Um, so in the Hotel Nantucket, when I needed someone, so for example, the editor of the newspaper, Jordan Randolph, he first appears in my novel, Summerland. And I thought, well, I need an editor for a newspaper. I'm going to use Jordan. Um, I had the chorus voice in this novel. It's entitled The Cobblestone Telegraph. Um, and they're just gossiping away. And Blonde Sharon is my gossip from the rumor. And I thought, I'm going to bring Blonde Sharon back. And she's going to be sort of leading the charge. And then peppered throughout are other characters that, that we know from other books. And you don't have to have read those books to enjoy the Hotel Nantucket. But if you have read those books, it's just, it's like a, it's like a little present for you. So you might have left an open window. Um, are we going to be getting a sequel to the Hotel Nantucket? I don't. Somebody else asked me that. I don't have anything planned. I only have two books left. And uh, neither one of them is going to be a, a sequel to the Hotel Nantucket. But it's not impossible that like an e-short will come out down the road. I love to do those sort of novellas that are like of the novel, but not sequentially following. So we'll see. We'll see. It's not impossible. And both Golden Girl and the Hotel Nantucket feature a character looking in from the great beyond. Yes. And in this one, we're obsessed with the charming, lovable, and quite mischievous friendly <laughs> ghost, Grace. 
what prompted you to go? Have you done it before in your other books or just these two? What prompted this teeny bit of paranormal? I know. So after writing Golden Girl, I definitely did not want to have a ghost in this book. I, and I, <laughs> I've never written a ghost, but I thought, well, I can't, I can't do a ghost. I just, I just had like an angel character and I, I can't, I can't do it again. That would be ridiculous. But <laughs> it was a crumbling, falling down hotel and, and I needed an omniscient narrator. You guys are novelists. So you understand I needed somebody in the hotel who could easily see into the rooms and know some things that we cannot possibly know. And I already had my sort of chorus voice. So I thought, okay, I, I need this ghost to help me out. And so I created Grace, who was killed in a fire in 1922. And, you know, she wants her murder acknowledged and she's making all kinds of trouble. And I was really, I, I just want to say, like, especially if I have any aspiring writers out there, I restarted this novel six times. Wow. No way. Could not get it right. Could not get the characters right. Could not get it off the ground was lying in bed at night thinking this is going to be a flop. I should have retired with golden girl. Like I intended, you know, I took a three book deal. I, did, I should never have done that. And I'm like, it was like for weeks. I'm like, I have messed up here. I should never, ever, ever have taken on this novel. And wow. then it's you're human, so Ellen, you're human. It's amazing. <laughs> I believe this. I know. And well, but I guarantee you that even on those days, she still worked out for three hours. So I don't think I human yeah. applies actually. <laughs> And I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought, what do I, who do I need to bring in? And I had like four different general managers and I had other people owning it and it was totally bananas. And then finally, like on my sixth try, I came up with the team of the cast of characters that we have presently. And so at some point in the middle of the summer, last summer, I walked into my house and I thought, this book is going to be good. I can't believe it. Like I can't, <laughs> believe it. but it all sort of came together. And that might have been the day I figured out who Shelley Carpenter was. I'm like, okay, this book is going to be good. But it was so difficult. And writing a novel with all of those characters and all of the elements and all the storylines and creating the universe is so hard. Yeah. And it just really takes perseverance. And I'm glad to hear that it took your perseverance. That, that it's not, oh, I sat down and I knew Grace and I knew, you know, it just flowed out of me. No. It's hard work. It's hard work. Um, well, ladies, in both of your novels, reinvention is is a huge theme. So Jamie, um, Gemma is not only starting over in a lot of ways, but she's also a budding jewelry designer coming back to claim her rightful spot in the family jewelry empire. Um, and the electric rose, the ring she was promised. Her aunts, Elodie and Celeste, have also found themselves at points of reinvention for a variety of reasons. And Ellen, so many characters in the Hotel Nantucket, from Edie to Alessandra, Chad to Xavier, and even the lovable ghost Grace, uh, are looking for their second chance. So can you guys tell us a little bit more about why this theme of reinvention was important to each of you? And have you ever faced a time in your own life where you felt like you were reinventing yourself? Um, Jamie, do you want to start? I'm going to switch over so you can have the screen. Oh, okay. Yeah, don't move the right there. Um, yes, I think, you know, I wish someone had told me when I was younger that life is all about reinvention. Yes. You know, the minute you become a mother, you're a different person. And then yeah. when the kids leave the nest, that's you're a different person. And each phase of your life, you have to adjust to be the best version of yourself in that phase. So I'm really preoccupied with it. Um, and I want to show, even though my protagonist Gemma is in her 20s, and you can think really how much the 20 year old, 20 something have to reinvent, she's had um, a history of family trauma. So she has to pull herself away from that and confront life um, from a more uh, powerful stance. And her aunts are in middle age, which I think is the most important time of reinvention because the world is extremely ready to write us off. Like, you know, we've done our thing and take the back seat now. And anyone who's reached that stage of life knows that's it's the world has never felt more open. So that's something I wanted to explore from the vantage point of the middle-aged sisters. And also reinvention gives you the chance to, to say, it's never too late to fix something, to say I'm sorry, to 
we do a mistake. And I think we go through life with a lot of fear that that's really not possible. So I wanted to show how in some ways, in many ways it is. Alan? Um, so I'm going to focus mostly on the reinvention of my main character, Elizabeth Keaton. So I, I, you know, in my, <laughs> in my uh, sort of search through the nebulous haze for how is this book going to work, I eventually landed on having a female general manager who had been through a horrible breakup. And it just felt really irresistible to me that she'd been through like this, this gruesome sort of emotional time and I wanted her to come out on the other side and find something new. Now, it's one thing to find something new when you live in the actual world. When you live on Nantucket and the island is four miles wide and 13 miles long, very, very challenging to, <laughs> to uh, reinvent yourself. And so that was what I, I wanted for Elizabeth. And this, this job for her, therefore, was perfect. And she really obviously wants to succeed at it. She isn't particularly thinking about a new man in her life. Um she doesn't think she's ready. One does appear and then she's embroiled in what I think is the greatest plot device of all time, the love triangle. So that's how that sort of ends up. That's great. I mean, so both of these novels are fun and fast paced reads and they have lots of life, great life lessons too. So um, what do each of you hope that your readers take away from, from these books? Oh, I think I'm still dwelling on the theme that I was playing out in my novel Blush last summer. Again, it's the idea that you don't have to or shouldn't wait for permission to go after what you want in life. Um, and sometimes, you know, we're so preoccupied with being polite and being good and being nice, we can lose a lot of time uh, playing that game. So I think the takeaway is, you know, go for it. I love that. I'll take that theme. I'll put it on my bulletin board. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I, I, I don't know. My personal motto is onward, just the one word onward. And so many characters, especially in, in the staff, have like they have drama and yeah. that they need to to work through. And um, especially like definitely Lisbeth, but also Chad. So Chad is like my young 20 two-year-old kid who's had a who's made a monumental mistake at home and everyone thinks he's privileged and you know he he's sort of a, a jerk and and doesn't you know and he really sets out and he takes a job as, the, as a chambermaid at the hotel and he really learns to sort of get past the image that everybody has of him i i love that you went there with chad and chad tuckett and the whole i was like like this is and when he doesn't order the vodka soda because he doesn't yeah. want to say vodka soda close it. I was like, oh my god! Like this is the greatest thing ever. I love that. <laughs> yeah, uh, last summer, um, Christy had to explain Chad Tuckett to me because I, I had no knowledge of Chad Tuckett. So if you don't, if you're watching, you don't. Know for. That's what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to. Um, yeah, she's, she's my, um, my spiritual guide to all things. Of this of this new century, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Jamie, I know that you before you were a novelist, like all of us, you had another life. You worked for Harper Collins and worked for Barnes and Noble dot com and Vogue dot com. So you know you've seen a lot of the sides of publishing and writing worlds. But tell us about your journey to becoming a published author. Sure, you know I took all those jobs because. I didn't think that I could actually be a writer. You know, there was no, I didn't have any examples of people having creative careers growing up. I grew up in suburban Philadelphia. And I literally remember telling my fourth grade teacher, oh, I want to be uh, a writer when I grow up. I don't think I said novelist. I think I, I want to be a writer when I grow up. And she looked at me and she said, well, maybe you can be a teacher. And oh. being a teacher is like, a f amazing profession and calling, but that is not what I said to her. And I definitely got the message back loud and clear. Um, and I always thought, well, I am going to at least work in books. So when I graduated college, I went to work at HarperCollins and various things. And what I slowly realized, and this is why I talk about 
not waiting for permission is I saw behind the scenes. I saw writers turn in messy manuscripts or late manuscripts. I, and I saw the team of people behind the scenes, the editors, the publicists who helped make a book, um, you know, reach the world. And it gave me the confidence to just try seeing that there's no magic to it. You know, that it's a lot of it, maybe more than half of it is, is effort. So um, that was my journey. I had to say, I'm never going to do this, watch other people do it, and then take the leap. Yeah. What advice, um, Jamie and Ellen, do you have for aspiring writers who, like so many of us, were looking to make a change in their lives and to figure out a path to being published? Reinvention, yeah. I mean, I think you just have to, do, you know, obviously there's the impetus to just get started and do it. That's actually not the hardest part. As you guys know, the hardest part is keeping with it. And when you get to the nebulous middle of your novel and you're like, what happens next? Um, it's, you know, that's when you have to keep going. I also really like to tell people to dramatize because um, one of the things that I don't care for in a novel is when when the author is telling me too much. You have to dramatize. You have to have scenes that have dialogue, that have setting, that have drama and conflict. So that when we're when you're referring to the book about someone else, oh, I loved the scene where, you know, Chad found his friend in one of the rooms, like that kind of thing. So you have a scene where something happens. And that and that is something that I think a lot of aspiring writers need to need to keep in mind. I think having worked in publishing, uh, a a mistake writers sometimes make is one, they don't read enough in the space that they're actually going to endeavor to write in. Um, so look, yeah, I think some people think- It's really interesting. Oh, you know, I read, um, you know, really literary stuff, but it might be easier if I start writing romance. But if you're not a true romance reader, and if you're not really inhabiting that space creatively and spiritually, it's going to be a very rough road. You know, if you want to write mystery, you have to, no, um, you have to have read it. Who else is on the mystery bookshelf? Um, what can you do differently? What do you want to, what good habits do you want to pick up? So I think for anyone starting out, first thing, define what you want to write. And hopefully it's something that you're already completely in love with. That's great advice. I've never heard that before. I yeah. love that. Um, and I needed to be reminded there's this one, I was just going through my manuscript and there's like this one scene that like plays out. To, I was like, oh, that doesn't need to be something that you're being told. That really needs to be a scene. And like, I don't want to write it. I just want to turn yeah. the book in. So thank you, Ellen. I need to do it. <laughs> Like maybe I can get away with it. No, I can't. Um, but you know what, Chrissy? It's usually the scene we want to summarize that ends up being the one that we need to see the most. And I don't know why that is. I don't either. It's like, I think it's always something that's, for me, it's always something that's really like emotionally heavy. And so having to like go there is just like hard and you have to like, for me, I feel like it's always a scene like that. It is in this book for sure. And I was reading it this morning and I was like, yeah, that's not going to cut it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Jamie That's and Ellen, summary. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not going to work. You both write about places that you love and at least in part that you live in. So for Ellen, you, of course, Nantucket is home. And Jamie, you're no stranger to your two settings in Guilt, New York City and Provincetown. And so this experience certainly brings this layer of authenticity to your stories. And I know firsthand from setting my Peachtree Bluff series in Beaufort, which of course everyone local knew what it was, um, that writing about a place that you know and love can bring about its own set of challenges. Like either people thinking that you wrote about them or that you didn't write about them or, you know, restaurants or businesses that you didn't include because they didn't work for your story. But why didn't you include them? I'm Ellen Genius to put a travel guide so everyone's included now. Um, but I'm just interested in like, you know, what is it like um, writing about a place that you love so much. And then what's the reaction locally been to that? Like, do you have a, I mean, I know Ellen, you've been doing it a long time, but do you have like a feeling for what, um, for what that response has been like? Um, I, I used to think, I, I used to say, I wasn't sure, like when I started writing, I wasn't sure I could even write about real places on Nantucket. So I think mm -hmm. right up into the castaways, I was using some real places, but I was also inventing places. And then at some point, 
it made sense that people were actually reading my books and looking for the real thing. And so I started writing about the real places and it has been fantastically received. I mean, everyone awesome. wants to be in one of the books, right? Everybody wants to be, you know, the scenes, whatever. And so knowing that now with that armed with that knowledge, I then sort of struck out to be more democratic about how I included people. And also like, I don't want to repeat myself by continuously having scenes unfold at the places where I'm always showing up. So I try and use different, different places, but in general, Nantucket has been very supportive. St. John has been even more supportive. Like St. John, oh, wow. I think it was just, I was very relieved about because I don't own property there. I am literally just a visitor. And yet every business owner, every single business owner that I have written about in St. John has reached out come in for dinner. We want to treat you, you know, no. it is ama amazing reception in St. John. That's awesome. And I am very grateful to that community. Jamie, I probably would have to, to write this more at Provincetown than New York city. Yeah. <laughs> They're probably not quite as, <laughs> it's probably a little harder to get. A... How does New York city feel about you writing? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, the whole city is in a thrall waiting for my next book. Um, but I don't think they even know I live, I lived there for 25 years. Provincetown, on the other hand, uh, oh my goodness, I felt almost nervous writing the first book set there because it's such a unique place with a huge history of writers and artists who spent time writing there and either painted the landscape or, you know, Michael Cunningham wrote a beautiful nonfiction book about Provincetown called Land's End. Um, so relieved when the people who I really respected there told me that like that I got it that the province town on the page in the forever summer and summer longing and now guilt is the is the province town they they recognize um but yeah there have I lived there the summer of 2020 when I wrote guilt and there's this woman um I'm not going to name names but <laughs> someone who owns a bunch of restaurants uh did confront me about having mentioned one place over her place in the previous novel. So I was very careful to write it in. But then I was just back last weekend and I was visiting my seamstress and she's like, I hope there's the seamstress in here because I think we talked about that. And I was like, did we? I can't, I'm, that was, I'm working on the next book. So <laughs> it's, it's great to have a small town that um, embraces and feels so invested, but I think you know, you've got to be careful of feelings and, um, you know, you want to, you want to celebrate everyone. So, but I love that place. It's, it's changed my life in a lot of ways. I, I went to Provincetown to write about it. And when the pandemic hit New York city, I moved there. Like I realized it was my favorite place in the world. I love that. That's awesome. Okay. This is like a super quick question. I know y'all get asked this all the time because I get asked this all the time also. Um, <laughs> Since it's summer vacation time, no bookstores, but can you give us like two or three of your favorite can't miss spots in Nantucket and Provincetown? Jamie, why don't you start us? Oh my gosh, people are traveling. In trouble. Oh, okay, oh. listen. All right. There's it's, a it's just us. Okay, you got it. Okay, just us. Between <laughs> you and me, Christy, and the just a few of us here. I mean, no bookstores, you said? Not yet. I'm okay, okay, okay. Later. Um, I mean, I love the canteen, which is my favorite go-to lobster roll, quick mm. dinner, uh, froze by the beach place. Yeah. Um, and the Anchor Inn is where I always stay and fantastic bed and breakfast. And I based the Beach Rose Inn in the Forever Summer on the Anchor Inn. I love that. That's awesome. What about you, Ellen? So... I do have one of the exciting things about the blue book. I mean, about the hotel Nantucket is the blue book at the end, which is my recommendation guide for Nantucket. You would not imagine, or maybe you can't imagine the number of requests I get for where mm -hmm. I'm going to Nantucket. I, next I week. Where oh, should yeah. I go? And so writing, about the, <laughs> writing the blue book was a little bit of self-preservation because I am now no longer going to answer any of those questions. I'm just going to send everybody to the blue book. <laughs> but if I had to pick three highlights that you absolutely should not miss, I would say, Sandbar at the Jetties, which is an easy walk from town. And it's, it's it sounds like it's a little bit like the canteen. It is on the beach, in the sand, um, you know, great fish sandwich, fish tacos, lobster rolls, and uh, raw bar, live music. So much fun. The Chicken Box, the best dive bar in all of America. You have to go there. Um, 
they have a lot of pilgrimage people, Ellen Hildebrand pilgrimage people showing up there and the owner and I are friends. So of course I FaceTime with them almost every single day. Um, just for a minute. And then I think the third place, I mean, why not say the Nantucket hotel, if you're looking to spend the night, the Nantucket hotel is the grand hotel in town that I based, uh, used for my novel. Oh, that's awesome. Love it. Okay. Let's talk about books. Um, I would like to know from both of you, if there are any books on your nightstand that we might be surprised to find there, Jamie, what about you? I don't know if there's a surprise because people who really know me would not, but um, I just got the biography of George Michael, George Michael of life. And I'm sure that. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, I, my two, well, right now I'm reading razor blade tears. So this feels very off brand, but I mean, these are the books that I like to read. So right now I'm reading razor blade tears by S.A. Cosby, right. uh, which is a thriller really, really good. And then my other favorite book this year was Notes. I can't even say it out loud without laughing because it's so off-brand. Notes on an Execution. It was such a good book. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's about a serial killer. He's on death row um, and it's the day he's to be executed. And his story is told by the women in his life, which are his mother, his wife's sister, and the detective who's caught him. It is absolutely riveting. And that sounds like so good. It was so good. And it's so like not necessarily what you might think of as a beach book, but it was the best book I've read this year. And I highly, highly recommend it. Notes on an execution. Right. You know, it's so funny what counts as a beach book, you know, often, it, you know, it's just a fast paced read. We, I, I texted all of them. I just finished Girl in Ice, which is from our guest last week, Erica oh. Fenner. And you're like, why would you read about a girl in ice in Antarctica on a trip to the Bahamas? But it was so good. So if you can read about an execution, I'll yeah. read about Antarctica. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, go ahead. What did you say, Mary Kay? I just said I sneezed. Oh, God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. All right. I want to go back to the question we got asked in the opener because now <laughs> I am so curious what y'all would say. So I'm gonna repeat the question in case um, it got lost in the shuffle. Imagine that you're Maui from the movie Moana and instead of transforming into a fish hook, you have a magic bookmark that lets you shape shift and you can shape shift in any way you want. You can benefit mankind, you can just have fun, it can be selfish, whatever you want. Who or what would you become, Ellen? I'm going to say an otter. <gasps> oh, that. That's a good one. An otter is my favorite animal for obvious reasons. It's just having so much fun. I love that. How about you, Jamie? I'm trying to wrap my, my mind around this. Um, didn't <laughs> see that movie. Love the idea. Um, well, I'm going to say some, a bird. I looked at my window here. I saw a bird uh, in North Carolina I've never seen before. It was this long white bird with a long beak. And I texted Christy, what is this? And what did you say it was? I think it's an egret. Okay, the egret looked From very happy. It looked very happy in this, in this environment. And I thought that would be a great way to go around the next time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, Ellen and Jamie, if you wouldn't mind sticking around for just a minute, we have one more thing to ask you, but first, just a few reminders from us. Always a quick reminder about our Writer's Block podcasts. So you know we have a podcast that is different than the show, and it drops every single Friday, and it's with our rock star librarian, Ron Block, therefore the Writer's Block. On the last episode, Ron talked to Kate White about her new thriller, The Second Husband, which was just released yesterday. And next week, he will be talking to Jacinda Townsend about her much lauded novel, Mother Country. And we'd also like to remind you guys about the Friends and Fiction Official Book Club, which is a separate Facebook group run by Brenda Gardner and Lisa Harrison, which, you know, they're otherwise known to us as PB&J. They have happy hours with our Writer's Block podcast host, Ron Block, and they keep everybody in the loop about suggested reads and upcoming releases. Up next, they're going to be discussing Book Lovers by Emily Henry on July 18th. 
And before we talk to Ellen and Jamie again, don't forget, don't, don't go nowhere because we have the awesome Robin Carr on the Afterwards show. Now, Ellen and Jamie, a little bit of a different final question for you guys tonight. Um, so for our readers who might not only vacation this summer in the pages of your books, but who might also be visiting the real Nantucket and the real Provincetown in real life, can you tell us all about a can't miss bookstore? Gosh, I really think we already know what you're going to say, each of you. But <laughs> <laughs> tell us about a can't miss bookstore that they must visit while they're there. Um, bonus points if uh, they can buy signed copies of your books at those stores. <laughs> Ellen? Uh, so there are, I live on an, an island, and um, there are the two independent bookstores that are on Nantucket are owned by the same people, and together they're called Nantucket Book Partners. They're a little bit different. Nantucket uh, Mitchell's Book Corner is on Main Street. It has a lot of signings. So Mary Kay signed there last summer. Mm -hmm. um, I sign every week, Wednesdays at 11. I was there today, long line. Um, Nancy Thayer signs there, Nat Philbrick, and then they have a lot of visiting writers. And then Nantucket Bookworks, which is on Broad Street, like two blocks away, it has a wonderful children's section. They have toys and games. Also, you know, wonderful books as well. And you, you can get signed copies of my books. And I feel like at times of the year, you can also get signed copies of your all, you all, y'all's books. Yes, yes. Y'all. Yes. <laughs> Y'all, that you did that. Oh, you did that really well, Ellen. We're I, proud. Really awkward. I feel like I did that really awkwardly, but no, no. <laughs> we we really bought into it. We were here for it. <laughs> All right, Jamie, you're up. So, Provincetown now only one bookstore left. People, we got to keep buying books from independent bookstores. Uh, the bookstore, luckily, it's a fabulous store, East End Books, owned by Jeff Peters, who's a Dynamo. And yes, you can get signed copies of my books. But I think more uh, importantly, you never know who you're going to see in this store. Mm -hmm. You know, you look over your shoulder, there's John Waters or there's some fabulous writer uh, who's trying to be um, under the radar in this town and failing miserably in the bookstore yeah, because yeah. readers seem to be hyper aware of noteworthy artists of all stripes. So East End Books, a must stop. Oh, I love it. Awesome. Well, Ellen and Jamie, this has been so fun. Thank you guys so much for coming on and spending time with us. Jamie and I have got two events, so we've got lots more fun to come. But um, everybody out there, if for some reason you have not yet read, I guess I can't get used to this. We've been doing it for two years and I still can't do it. If you have not read Tell Nantucket yet, run, do not walk to your local independent bookstore or check out our bookshop.org page and make sure that you check out these fantastic, fantastic reads uh, for summer or really any time of the year. And ladies, thank you for just being so open and honest and answering our questions and talking about your lives and reinvention and um, all of these beautiful things. We're so grateful for your time. And we know that everybody out there echoes that sentiment and happy summer. Thank you. Happy thank summer. you for having me. I'm so, so grateful. Love you, Jamie. Good to see you. And don't forget, you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We are live there every week, just like we are on Facebook. And if you subscribe, yeah, you just shove Brit, um, Jamie out of there. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to send her out to the yard with salt. He really <laughs> likes her. He really <laughs> likes her. Um, Jamie, awesome. come back. Come on. <laughs> like, want to like, sit on her feet at lunch. And, you know, oh, she's been very patient. So <laughs> um, but be sure to come back. Same. Now I'm messed up. But be sure to come back next week, same time, same place, as we welcome Al Kajashi and Martha Hall Kelly. Anita Prose will join us for the after show. And don't go anywhere because we've got Robin Carr coming right up. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Hey. What a night, you guys. Oh my Yay. goodness, wasn't it so fun? I, I just feel like I had so many more questions. Yeah. Um, I like your always in the um, credits because it feels like she's here with us. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, and I'm sorry that I accidentally muted Jamie for like three seconds in the middle of while she was talking. I was like, 
getting ready to say something to you guys in the chat. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't mute her. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was fine. It was fine. We, we got the gist of it. Um, <laughs> I know Kristen is here in our announcements, Meg. You're right. Like, she's not really That's not right. here. I know. She's yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, um, gosh, you guys, we have another great guest coming up. So let's welcome our friend um, Robin Carr in just a second. Robin Carr is the number one. Gosh, that seems to be a theme tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> number one New York Times bestselling author of more than 60 books, including the popular Virgin River, Thunder Point, and Sullivan's Crossing series. All of Robin's books are about strong women. For example, on the screen. Her titles have collectively sold over 27 million copies, been translated into 19 languages in 30 different countries. 11 of her novels have earned the number one spot on the New York Times bestselling book list. And not only that, in recognition of the significant contributions Robin has made to the genre, the Romance Writers of America awarded her with the 2016 Nora Roberts Lifetime Achievement Award. Her series Virgin River has been turned into a television series for Netflix. It is incredibly addictive, you guys. So I highly recommend it as your next binge watch if you haven't dipped in yet. I think there's four seasons now. I don't know. We'll have to ask Robin. We'll have to ask her, yeah. Yeah. Robin now resides in Las Vegas, Nevada. Her children are grown and they've made her a happy grandmother. Erica, can you bring Robin on? Hi, Hi Robin. Robin. At long last. Hi, girls. Good to Welcome see you. Welcome to Friends in Fiction. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. And Mary Kay, thank you for the book and the oh. sweet note. I was so touched. Thank you. My pleasure. Always. Robin, it's so great that we finally worked this out. We have been dying to talk to you. Yeah. So we asked Ellen and Jamie earlier about the theme of reinvention in their novels. And the four of us who are here, including Meg, have all had other jobs before the job that we do now. And it seems to play a big role in your novel, A Family Affair. Anna McNichol is at a place where her world is falling apart and she must pick herself back up and carry on. Why do you think this message is important to you? And what do you hope readers take away? I feel like we're reinventing ourselves every morning. Doesn't it seem I that love way? love that. Yeah. Every day, it, just, it seems like, who am I going to be today? And how am I going to be? And what am I going to do? And you know, I mean, all the women I know and hang with, they want to leave the world a better place. And they found it. And yep. um, and that's a very, very popular theme in my books. Oh, that's so great. Do you feel like it echoes your own life, like thinking about reinvention, that you carry it through in your novels? I do. I have to. I mean, I I mean, they don't don't blink, don't turn your back. I mean, something's gonna creep up and throw you off kilter and yeah, yeah. That's so true. You have to be flexible and you have to be ready to reinvent yourself all the time. Not just your characters, but yourself. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You got to stay nimble. That's what I think. There we go. I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I'm, I, I'm recently divorced. That's something I never thought I would be. Oh, wow. And, uh, and talk about reinventing yourself. You really have, you know, you have to start from scratch almost and For think sure. what who am i yeah yes and i think i'm going to go in my closet and throw away all the clothes that remind me of my couplehood and see if that helps <laughs> that <laughs> sounds like a great opening scene for a novel it really yeah. does exactly what i was going to say like i, I hope still burning his clothes in the driveway i'll just throw away <laughs> I love it. That's I such a great idea. Therapy, you know? I love that. Fresh start. It's great. It's so symbolic. I love it. Yeah. Okay, Robin, we love the role of family in this novel. Of course, all your novels. This family absolutely has its ups and downs, but ultimate, ultimately, it's a family that gets them, it's family that gets them through the hard times. 
And, you know, what you just shared with us about going through a divorce recently, what role did your own family play in the inspiration, if, the, if there was any inspiration for this particular novel? Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a son and a daughter grown, and, um, and they're very, very different. And, uh, and, they, and they coped with my divorce in very different ways. And so I wanted to capture that with, with Anna's kids and how, they, how different they were in accepting the death of their father. So that seemed a really good vehicle. And I, I know those characters. I've been related to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, did your family ever come back to you and say, Mom, that's not how it is. You're wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they do that. But what they do more is they say, you wrote about this is our life. And you wrote about it. I said, well, you know, it's my life, too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that. I used to love, I used to read, I guess I read in uh, one, Nora Ephron's, one of her books that, you know, her mother was her and Delia and the other sisters, um, their mother was a very, their, both their parents were very well-known, successful screenwriters. And her mother, I guess, was on her deathbed and looked at her daughters and said, remember, girls, everything is material. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that's true. true. I think that goes without saying. Yeah. And I think it's Anne Lamott who says, um, if you something about you can write about whoever it is, it's your life too. And if it if they should have been nicer to you, or you wouldn't have put them in the novel. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I find myself constantly asking people if I'm at like a dinner party or something and somebody tells a great story, I'm like, wait, but can I use that in a book? Like disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you ask permission? I'm so proud of you. I don't. I don't. Ask. <laughs> Better to ask forgiveness. Yeah, Absolutely. Oh, you forgiveness. said that? I'm so sorry. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> I had a really neat experience with a couple of my girlfriends. Um, we were sitting around my living room after lunch, and uh, and one of them said, what do you like to do, like, in your off time? And I had this moment of total shame because I don't do anything. I'm not, I'm not, I don't skydive or scuba dive or go kayaking or anything really fun and admirable and challenging. And um, my, the other friend, the third one in the group said this, I like to do this. I like and I could have just kissed her, you know, because... <laughs> Sitting around the living room with a glass of wine talking, that's my idea of a good time. I, you know, I don't have to practice. I don't have to learn anything. No new skills there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, we can't possibly have Robin Carr on the show without getting a little Virgin River scoop. Um, so we're not only fans of the Netflix series, um, but the books, of course. And can you tell us where, will there be more Virgin River books, Robin? And and what's oh, going? Oh, I can't tell you that. I can't. Oh. I don't. You know, if I get if I get a really good idea, there will be. Oh. Awesome. But at this moment, that you know, it doesn't. Nothing occurs to me. I'm working okay. on something else. Interesting. So, so, what's going on with the show? Well, the uh, fourth season drops in uh, on July twentieth, and they're filming the fifth. It's a birthday oh, gift to me. Yeah, there you go. It's, a birthday. <laughs> it's the sixteenth, but it's close. Close, yeah, it's close yeah. enough. Happy birthday! <laughs> What's it been like, Robin, to have to watch your work be adapted for the screen like that? It's How's really that? a lot of fun, and and I keep the um, I keep the perspective that it's like two for the price of one. If you really enjoy the Netflix series you might enjoy the books. And if you really enjoy the books, you might enjoy the Netflix ser series. I don't um, I don't judge. Sometimes I think, now why didn't they use my twist on that story? And uh, other times I think, oh damn, I wish I thought of that. <laughs> I love it. I love it's all it. different, it's all different. And I stay away from it because um, I don't know anything about making movies. I make books. And I could, if somebody asked my opinion, I could screw it up in five minutes. So, <laughs> or less. Or less. Yeah. Off, you know? They're I've doing heard, a 
Well, they did a great job. I've heard other authors um, say that, um, you know, their job was done. Like I wrote the book and that my piece of this puzzle is finished. And so what someone else chooses to do with that story now as a, as a TV show or a movie, it, you kind of have to wash your hands of it or. Think, you have you know, to, you have to be willing to let go of it. It's, yeah. it's not yours anymore. You know, and in fact, some people have, have written me and said, how could you let them change so much? And, and I write them back and say, the book is right where I left it. Yep, exactly. I like that. So yeah. you're so you're so prolific. I mean, there you, you've written so many books and so many different series, and and so maybe there I'm are so old. Right, <laughs> <laughs> but so maybe there's some people out there in friends in fiction land who haven't read your books yet, and so if there's someone who's just discovered you via. Uh, Virgin River series on TV, but hasn't yet read you. Is there a point? At, is there a is there a book that you suggest they start as a jumping off? Well, point? if you're interested in Virgin River, start with Virgin River. It's the first one in the series. I think there are 21, and um, they're listed and numbered in order on my website, robincar.com. Makes it real easy. And I've written four series. Um, the Grace Valley series, Virgin River, Thunder Point, and Sullivan's Crossing. And Sullivan's Crossing is now being filmed. Wow. Ooh, that was amazing. Amazing. Is and that Netflix too? It, I, I don't know when it will air. I have no idea. It's just started filming. Is it Netflix, Robin? Not no, not necessarily. I don't know where who it will be in the United States yet. Could be Netflix. It could be somebody else. That's amazing, Robin. How many books have you written, Robin? Do you know? I think I think sixty-four. Wow, that's a I've lot. I've been doing this for forty-five years. But I mean, even still, sixty-four books in forty-five years—it's a lot. Of I books. know. I'm a little tired. I think I should, <laughs> I'm tired I think just I hearing you say it. <laughs> and it's time to happen. clean out your closet anyway. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to clean out my closet. That's my short-term goal. We look great in yellow, so we hope you keep that blouse. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I think I'm going to keep this one. I don't know. I can. You should. I can. I can get, curse out the energy. <laughs> <It's bad>. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that can. Um, it can be like your new friends and fiction blouse. Like you can associate it with us now, right? Goodness. Yes. Right. I can. Yeah. <laughs> Robin, this is a favorite question of ours on friends and fiction, and we wanted to ask you tonight. What were the values around reading and writing in your family when you were growing up? Non-existent. Um, I, oh, I mean, wow. I was not I was not a reader as a child, although my grandmother and I used to go to the library every every few weeks or so. And I and I used to get a big stack of books that I um, usually that I couldn't read and um, and. And I didn't, I didn't read very often. I played outside and I had to be home when the streetlights came on. And, uh, and so I was, I was out, I was out with friends and busy. Um, my, one of my favorite books is A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. I was that one is of my two. favorite book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It was one of, one of the few that I read and I have very fond memories of when I was in college we passed around love story. Um, Adore. And Allie story McGraw and you know a favorite book. But I, I went to nurses training and uh, didn't read much fiction, just read nursing books. And um, and when I got pregnant, I got married and got pregnant, and I had to have my feet up a lot. So I started reading romance after romance after romance. And uh, back in the early 70s, it was like Anya Seton and Rosemary Holly Jarman. We didn't have a mass market industry back then. Right. Kathleen so, Woodowis? Pardon? What, Kathleen Woodowis, was she on that list? Um, she was one of the, my early reads. She published in 75. Yeah. In fact, I, I made my daughter read it. I hounded her for years and years and years, and she finally read it. And she what, said, you mean really, around? mother, really, mother. <laughs> there was sexual, there's sexual assault in this book. But was oh, it for that one? Are you talking about Forever Amber? No, for, no, uh, Kathleen Woodowis. 
Right. Oh, the flower and the flame. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I interviewed when I was a newspaper reporter, Robin. I interviewed Kathleen Woodowitz in the frozen foods aisle of a Kroger. Oh, you're insane. I was, yeah. I was so far superior to her. Like, oh, this little romance writer, she's sitting at a table in the frozen food aisle at Kroger. There were lines around the store, and she wow. had a golden ring. This, like, this big diamond ring. And I thought, hmm. One day, I'd like to be in the frozen food aisle at Kroger. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> at a card table. Yeah. See, it was life changing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. The other question we love to ask on the show, and after 65 books, I'm dying to hear your answer. Do you have a writing tip for us and for our viewers? They love to hear writing tips from authors. Do you have a tip that really helps you or that you love to give to it's not here. it's not original so i um i give i would give uh, nora roberts and, and probably many other writers credit for the answer but um you have to be willing to write crap <laughs> you have to write anyway yep. even if the, if you're not inspired and you don't have ideas and in every single book from early on, I get to a point where I think, well, oh, it's happened. I'm empty. It's all gone. I have nothing. You know? <laughs> well, as our it. MKA says, you can't fix what you ain't wrote. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, and Robin. I think, I, think that's, I think that's the key, right anyway. Yep. Robin, we wanted Jamie Brenner's here and she wanted to come say hi to you. She's with me in Beaufort today. Hi, Robin. Hi, Jamie. Fan. And I've got to tell you, I did discover your books through the show. At a time I needed escape, I said I need to go into a world removed from all this. And you gave it to me when I needed it. And I just, I love both. The difference is, doesn't matter the experience, the feeling, escapism is just so wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. That's thank awesome. you. My pleasure. Do we have time for the last question? Do I get to ask the last question? Absolutely. Ask the last question. Okay, Robin, do you have a book recommendation for us that you, something that you're loving lately or that people might not think, oh, why would Robin Carr read that? No, I am reading a book that um, I'm going to, uh, my, my friend, Kristen Higgins. Um, just oh, wrote, she's so her? funny. What I is it? Out of the clear blue sky. Yeah. Out of the blue clear sky. Out of blue, the, clear, and out the clear blue sky. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I picked it up. Um, uh, my daughter said, "Have you read Kristen's book yet?" Because I'm seeing a lot of your of your dialogue in there. And I said, "Really?" So I picked it up to have a look. And um, I'm I'm going to call her later on today and tell her that I'm done writing her dialogue for her. She's just going to have to <laughs> have to do it on her own. It's really good. It's really good. It grabbed me on the very first page. I, I love her work. She's terrific. Yeah, she's great. She's great. Fresh. That's awesome. Well, Robin, we cannot thank you enough for joining us tonight. What a joy to have you here. And congrats on all your success. And thank you again to Jamie for being here with us as our guest today and to Meg for filling in for Kristen. And we can't wait to see all of you next week right here on Friends in Fiction. Same time, same place. See you then. Good night, Thanks everyone.